Welcome to Instruments Direct. Our program today is entitled The Science Behind Ultrasonic Flow Meters. In our program today, we're going to talk a little bit about what is an ultrasonic flow meter, the theory of operation of clamp on ultrasonic Doppler, theory of operation of clamp on ultrasonic transit time, some typical applications economics of ultrasonic flow meters. Sound is a mechanical wave that is an oscillation of pressure transmitted through some media like air or water and it's composed of frequencies within the range of hearing. On the other hand ultrasound is sound with a frequency greater than the upper limit of human hearing greater than 20 kilohertz. Did you ever blow a dog whistle? Yes, dogs have a different hearing range and hear different frequencies. An ultrasonic flow meter is a type of meter that measures the velocity of fluid with ultrasound to calculate volumetric flow. And today we're going to talk about one subset of ultrasonic flow meters, the clamp-on ultrasonic flow meters. And its novelty is that you can put a, a transducer on the outside of the pipe and monitor the flow on the inside of the pipe without putting any holes or ports or actually wetted contact with the process liquid. Now there's different types of ultrasonic flow meters and we're going to focus on two. The ultrasonic Doppler flow meter, the ultrasonic transit time flow meter. Now all meters have a specific requirement for it to work. You need these set of specifications for it to do its optimum performance and the most common optimum item to make things work is you need to have so much straight run of pipe. So let's quickly touch base on flow hydraulics. Now, you've heard the term, give me 10 to 15 pipe diameters, and the reason why is pictured here and left over here, it says symmetrical flow. What you like to have in this cutaway diagram is 10 to 15 pipe diameters of straight run of pipe, and what you'll get on the inside of your pipe will look like this. Uh, just like uh, flow is at the fastest here and slowest near the pipe wall. Just for example, a man in the uh, motorboat going down the river and the wake cast out behind it, well, that's pretty much what the flow profile is going to look like. These elliptical shapes here are defined as Reynolds numbers and they will be more blunt and elliptical based upon the flow rate. But what is important here is if you were to draw a center line down this flow, the top half of flow equals the bottom half of flow. And so this situation, if you were to have an elbow and 10 pipe diameters, put your sensor here and have another five pipe diameters after the next elbow you would have a symmetrical flow profile if your flow rate was around 10 feet per second. If you had more flow rate greater than 10 feet per second then you would need additional straight run of pipe. If you had less than 10 feet per second you could get by with a less straight run of pipe. Now I notice I said from elbow to elbow this is designed for that type of parameter there. If you, you have to have an unobstructed line, no probes or valves within that line. If you had some serious disruption, I had a butterfly valve over here as opposed to a 9 degree elbow uh, or a pump, you might want some additional straight run of pipe. Now the opposite of this is what's called an asymmetrical flow profile. And in this case there, I have a 90 degree elbow. And when I come up this elbow here, you notice right here I have a shorter distance to get to the other side and I have a longer distance to get to this side. Well, you can't stop the flow. It's going to come through the pipe and it's going to jumble or become very turbulent, as one might say, at this point. And if you were to put your flow meter right here, you would probably not get your best results or no results at all. So uh, you would go downstream from this elbow. 10 pipe diameters to put your sensor and have another five on the other side. Again, the purpose of doing this is optimum performance. In some cases there, if you have too great of turbulence with a transit time meter, you won't get anything at all. 
Horizontal and vertical doesn't really make that much difference. Uh, on the horizontal line, do just take note. You can some, get some solids on the bottom and aeration on the top. So the sides of the pipe, 9 to 3 o'clock, might be an optimal place to put your flow sensors if you have that choice. Let's give some credit to the Doppler theory to Christian Johann Doppler. Now, he's a 19th century Austrian physicist and he wrote the papers on the Doppler effect that you probably all learned back in grade school. And to take a look at that, let's say the long version of the description is uh, as the train approaches, the sound waves are compressed towards the observer, you. The intervals between waves diminish, which translates into an increase in frequency or pitch. So as the train recedes, the sound waves are stretched relative to the observer, causing the train's pitch to decrease. By the change in pitch of the approaching train, you can determine if it's coming nearer or speeding away. If you can measure the rate change of pitch, you could also estimate the train's speed. Now, everybody has this Doppler equation already in the back of your head. So if you were to stand on the curb and there was a truck in the distance, you closed your eyes, you don't even have to see it, and you heard the truck coming, you heard the change of frequency or pitch, guess what? You would know if the truck was coming towards you to get out of the way, or it's going the other way. So we already know how the Doppler equation works and how it applies to us. Now we need to know how it applies to monitoring flow. Well, the Doppler flow meter, if we were to take a sensor, and uh, interface it with some acoustic coupling and put it on the outside of the pipe, then get it to transmit a frequency through the pipe wall into the liquid. The objective would be the sound is reflected back to the sensor from suspended particles or bubbles. If the fluid is in motion, the echoes return at an alternated frequency proportionate to flow velocity and the Doppler flow meter continuously measures the frequency shift to calculate flow. Now, key item with the Doppler flow meter is it needs to have suspended particulate matter in the process stream or you get nothing. Analogy. Police radar gun. Car driving down the road, police radar gun, transmits a frequency, bounces off the car, comes back, says, okay, car's going 100 miles an hour. No one's ever had a ticket, I'm sure. C policeman's radar gun takes a zap, and there's no car going down the road. Guess what? No signal back. Ultrasonic Doppler flow meter, no solids in the pipe, no signal back. How many solids do you need? It's different for different manufacturers. House rule, 100 parts per million, 30 microns or larger of suspended, underline that, solids or aeration for this to work. How big is 30 microns? Tip of the pencil per the dictionary I think is 100 uh, microns so it puts it in relevance of what we're, what we're looking for. Let's talk more about suspended solids. Nobody seems to get it. Here's clean water. Ultrasonic Dopplers do not work in clean water unless they were heavily aerated and unless you have zero pressure in your line it never will be heavily aerated. If you get any pressure in the line the bubbles will never be properly dispersed, and so you usually not have any success in introducing air to a line. You get more than a couple pounds of pressure, aeration goes to the top of the pipe, or it just doesn't work. Opaque liquids. Opaque liquids are that. They are a colored liquid that has dissolved solids. All the time people call us up and say, I have so many dissolved solids, and we say, that's nice. It doesn't mean anything for the world of Doppler flow meters. So uh, if you were to have a cup of tea and you had a nice good tea bag and there were no tea flakes or leaves in the drink or your cup, it looks opaque. And if that was came out of a waste treatment plant, you'd say, I'm not going to drink that. The problem is the solids are all dissolved. They're not suspended. A Doppler flow meter will not work on that. Applications that have chunks of stuff like a slurry application that looks like oatmeal, sludge, mining application, paper stock, those have high level of solids. Those have applications that you don't want to put an invasive device in the process stream because it will clog up, fail, or coat. 
perfect applications for ultrasonic Doppler flow meters. So ultrasonic Doppler flow meters generically work in some sewage applications, definitely sludge applications. You're going to use them in the, the wastewater side of the, of the liquid applications. You're going to use it in mining. You're going to use it in dredging. You're going to use it in pulp of paper and slurry-like applications is its optimum performance. You need 100 parts per million suspended solids or aeration, 30 microns or larger, just to get it to work. And there was some confusion time, and I only bring this up because I was involved. Back in the old days, when the Doppler flow meter people were in the transit of trying to keep up with the transit time flow meter people, Polysonics and Dynasonics came out with something called a clean liquid Doppler. And uh, these devices were only around in the early 90s. And basically, we took the, uh, put a hearing aid on an ultrasonic Doppler flow meter and put the sensors at a 90 degree elbow and reflect it off of turbulent flow. So they read something, they weren't very accurate. It was basically a stepping stone to go from Doppler to transit time technology. Uh, and they are not around anymore. They did not work very good. They read something. So cross off clean liquid Dopplers off your list uh, for you old timers. Which brings us up to ultrasonic transit time. Let's give some credit to Lord Riley, English physicist, 1842 to 1919, Nobel, Prize, Nobel Prize for Physics in uh, 1904. And we're going to give some credit because he wrote the theory of sound in 1877, which laid some of the groundwork for us to use transit time as a method of monitoring flow. So a nice analogy is a man in a rowboat. Well, we have a river and a man in the rowboat, and he'd like to cross the river. And uh, you notice on the left-hand side here, we have flow going from left to right. So when the man gets in the river, he crosses the river, he gets carried downstream with the current, he monitors how long it took him. But when he comes back across the river, he's going against the current, so it takes him a longer period of time to return, a longer transit time. You notice, unlike the Doppler theory, we have to bounce off of chunks of stuff. The transit time is using time and distance to calculate flow. The differential between the transit time across and the transit time back is the coefficient we use to derive on how fast the river is flowing. So if the flow is faster, he's going to go across the river faster, but when he comes back, he's going to come back even slower. So the faster the flow rate, the greater the differential. So if we were to apply this theory to uh, two sensors on the outside of a pipe, Step one, you notice that the flow is ricocheting off the back wall. Well, the man in the rowboat would be here, and we put it over here, but we're lazy, so we're going to put two sensors on the same side of the pipe just because it's easier. Again, flow going from left to right. We take this transducer, send a sound beam, ricochet off the wall, come downstream, we measure how long it has taken. At the same time, we send a sound beam from this guy, cross the wall, but because I'm going against the current, it takes a longer period of time. The greater the flow rate, the greater the differential, and that's the coefficient we use to calculate volumetric flow. Now there's different configurations and how to put these on the pipe there. Here in the lower right hand corner is the man in the rowboat and depending on the manufacturer that you work with this is either known as the Z or the direct method and it's traditionally used on larger pipe size applications just because it's not as easy to put on the pipe. So say traditionally 24 inches and larger that's what you would use this type of configuration. Uh, or you would use it on smaller pipe applications that you had poor pipe conditions, pipe buildup, or lack of straight run of pipe. The configuration on the top here is the most common. This is called the V or the dual path configuration. This is traditionally used in application say a half inch to 24 inches and it's easier because both of the sensors can be in a track on the same side of the pipe so you can see what's going on. There are other configurations. Uh, we said the V and we said the Z and in even some manufacturers have the W and we use this primarily in smaller pipe sizes where they, they don't have multiple frequencies for their different transducers. 
and you also note that these are single beams. There's other ultrasonic flow meters that have multi-path, but today we're going to focus on this technology. An ultrasonic transit time flow meter is a complicated beast. And in days of old, when you had your big suitcase and your ultrasonic transit time flow meter in there, you spent some time in the setup. You had to calculate everything out, and the sensors had to be in the perfect locations. And after you got done pulling your hair out, half the time you got a good reading, and the other half the time you had to play with it even further. So a sign of frustration, but this is a long time ago, and today the ultrasonic transit time technology has evolved to the point where it's a commodity technology for water-like applications. It does it, most of it, by itself. So if we looked at the, the way that this thing really works, we'd have to get a transducer, and inside this transducer is a crystal at a specific angle based upon the manufacturer's calculation. Everybody's got a different angle. And for that reason, you cannot switch different transducers with different brands of manufacturers of ultrasonic flow meters because everybody makes their chicken soup differently. So here we've got a transducer at a certain angle, and we have to transmit through this pipe. So the pipe right here, we need to know the sound speed of that pipe. And if you had an application that had a liner, we need to know the sound speed of that liner. There's a refraction when it hits the process liquid. We need to know the sound speed of the liquid. And then when it hits the pipe size, there's another refraction. We need to know the liner. We need to know the pipe material. And we need to know the transducer. And then we know the sound speed going across once. Well, in the older technologies, it didn't go back and forth there very, very fast. But now we can go up to 1,000 times a second back and forth. So a lot more has happened. And many, many, many of these functions are automated now. They're dropped on menus, and it calculates out itself. Sound speed is an interesting situation. In the old days, you had to calculate some sound speeds out, come up with some bizarre numbers, call the factory, call it the manufacturers. Because in doing this, to calculate the sound speed, we really had to come up with one grain of information, which makes the difference here, is C is a coefficient of stiffness, the bulk modulus or modulus bulk elasticity. Basically, it's the density. Therefore, the speed of sound increases with the stiffness of the material and decreases with the density. You said, that's nice. How in the world am I going to do that? Well, for the most part, the flow meters will have a drop-down menu for almost every process liquid you're using. Water, drop-down. Glycol, drop-down. Motor oil, drop-down. No big deal. But if you had an exotic chemical that you developed and it's not on our wonder charts, then we need to calculate out the bulk modulus. And the bulk modulus, as we said, is basically the substance compressibility. And in order to do this, we have to do some interesting calculations. But what do you do in the field? The best thing, if you have a chemical that you don't really know what it is, one, you can call us. We have many charts that aren't published. But two, find a process liquid with a similar specific gravity. It's a very good starting reference point to determine if that's the right sound speed for your process liquid. So you can see the complexity that we're driving to, all the information we have to get to get your best optimum performance to get this transit time flow meter to read your 1% your rates kind of accuracies here. But again, these are all behind the scenes. And another big difference between old and new was the sound speed of mixed process liquids. So for example, uh, water and glycol, very commonplace application. Water glycol application, let's say we had a sound speed of water, 4,900 feet per second, sound speed of glycol, 5,440 feet per second. We would have to come up with a ratio, and most common ratio in the HVAC industry is 30% mix of glycol, 70% 6 mix of water. So we do the math, 30% glycol, 1632. 70% water, 34 or 35, we come up with a sound speed of 5,067 feet per second. Old days, you had to dial in 5,067 feet per second. Nowadays, not so much. If you had less than a 10% change of sound speed, just program in water. Most of the newer technologies will auto-adjust for optimal sound speed. And if you have a diagnostic screen on your transit time flow meter, you can just set it up for water. 
you're running a water application, go to the diagnostic screen and find out what the actual sound speed is. There are some variances based upon temperature and other things, but the flow meter will take care of business in days of old. It didn't take care of business. The circuit design of an ultratonic transit time flow meter, again, is very complex. And these are the supporting methodologies behind this. Remember, we're transmitting, we're receiving it, we're conditioning these signals, and now we're also applying our auto optimization. Again, drop down menus, you don't have to work about it. You punch in your pipe information, you go to your drop down process liquid, you go to your drop down process pipe material, and it gives you your spacing, and you're done. Examples of portable ultrasonic transit time flow meters, there's a whole bunch of them out there. Some of the technologies I would put in what I would call professional ultrasonic transit time flow meters would be like the GE, the Fuji, non-contact meters, uh, Flexum, uh, Siemens, uh, uh, Thermo, Dynasonics. These are the ultrasonic transit time flow meters that are the most popular that achieve the overall accuracies, the 1 to 2% kind of thing that you're looking for professional flow monitoring. Ultrasonic transit time flow meters are a device designed for aqueous base applications. There are some gas and air ultrasonic transit time flow meters for specialty applications that are high pressure, metal pipe, and really not very easy to use. So for the most part, they're not really a device that you're going to use for the process environment or HVAC environment. Um, so ultrasonic transit time flow meters are designed for water applications, oil applications, any hydronic liquid, any aqueous liquid, we use it for water, wastewater, energy management, test and balance, cooling tower, process control, uh, tomato soup, you name it, goes down the list there. Where does a transit time flow meter work with regards to solids? We just talked about Dopplers that need lots of solids. Transit time flow meters are predominantly a clean liquid flow meter. And where do they work? Well, on the clean side, let's say ultra pure liquids. We're looking at a deionized water. We're looking at a refined fuel. We have a jet fuel with specific gravity of 0.4. We have water. We have sewage. And those work fine. So ultrasonic transit time flow meters work great on ultra pure liquids up to around 2% solids by volume. So sludge applications, leave it to the Doppler. Dopplers work from sewage to sludge. Ultrasonic transit time flow meters work from ultrasonic, ultra pure water, sewage, but not sludge. All right, ultrasonic transit time flow meters have other variations within it. The clap on ultrasonic dedicated transit time flow meters price point has dropped to the point where it is now replacing invasive insertion, paddle wheel, magnetic flow meters, turbine flow meters, because you can buy a dedicated clamp-on ultrasonic transit time flow meter for 2000 bucks or less. Why put a hole in the pipe? Accuracies are equal to or better. Why put it in the pipe? Cost is there, installation is there, and now if it's that economical, you need to consider using it for your process environment or your HVC environment. And In that case there, we need to say hello to it. Well, if you wanted to say hello to the technology, we added different levels of communication because we also added other features. If you add temperature to the equation, you can actually calculate and monitor BTU. Interesting. So now I have all these parameters there. I added communication so you can transmit your 4 to 20. You can transmit your Modbus. You can now transmit using variations of Ethernet, BACnet, Modbus, TCP IP. You know the new printer you got down the hallway, you plug it into the Ethernet port and you run down the hallway to your uh, computer and you can see and print and go back and forth there. Each of the flow meters have their own IP address now. How about that? So we're now in the 20th century as far as communication with ultrasonic flow meters. So you can say hello to the flow meter, tie it into your Niagara system, or just transmit it to your desktop should you need to. Data collection. Part of the portable ultrasonic transit time flow meter is collecting data on a portable basis there. And the data loggers of old would just drive you out of your tree. They were DOS based, then they were, uh, you need software, they were had to take a SIR report to get it out, an I report to get it out. You only had 100,000 data points. Now, 
newer technologies have an SD card that stores the data as a CSV file. You're done taking a log and the log you can take, the cards are like two gigs or larger so you can store data until the cows come home. There is no upper capacity at this point in time. Uh, you take the card out, plug it in your laptop or PC, turn on Excel and open the CSV file. So you may actually use uh, data logging uh, than like you never did before because it's just not a convenient source of collection of data. As I said, monitoring temperature has become extremely popular with dedicated applications and even more so with portable applications. So with the portable situation here, you can now take a portable meter, clamp on your flow sensor on the supply line, clamp on a platinum RTD sensor on your supply line, clamp on a platinum RTD sensor on your return line, bring all this data back to the flow meter, and the flow meter will log all your data and provide you with BTU. So now you can log flow, you can log temp1, log temp2, calculate BTU, save it on that SD card because you got all that data storage there and you can do a complete flow survey of temperature monitoring using BTU. And the way the configuration works, just look at a little tighter picture here. Uh, this would be the supply line for example, so there's going to be a strap-on platinum RTD and this would be great for metal pipe applications. We'd use this sensor and some uh, thermal compound to transfer the temperature to the sensor. The independent transducers, when you get them from the factory, they're already better than 1% differential between the two transducers and that's what you're looking for for BTU calculations is differential temperatures. Uh, and then this information would all go back to the flow meter. As we touched on portable flow meters, because they're so popular and easy to use, things to consider with today's technology is to get something that's relatively small. You can get newer devices, and these are again what I would call an, a professional ultrasonic transit time flow meter that has the ability to have multiple frequencies, because without multiple frequencies you can't do a very good job in your small, medium, and large pipes. If you just have one frequency, you do have some limiting factors on your small and your large size. Handheld portables are great. You should get something with a shoulder strap. Single piece transducers can make your life very happy. If you have uh, some of the older transducers, they would have chains and a bag full of parts to put the sensor in the pipe, so you can spend 20 minutes setting it up. Single piece transducers, you can literally hand hold it on the pipe if you needed to. Uh, an installation after that is pretty simple. So if time is money, then uh, simple, single piece transducers are considering very helpful. Easy to program. The technology today, you know, you still get your 200 page manual there, but we've written two page manuals for most of the meters that we offer here today. You don't need to know everything, but to monitor flow, you need to know these six things. To monitor BTU, you need to know these six things. To log data, you need to load these four things and so on. So we've broken it down so in 15 minutes we can make you dangerous on using an ultrasonic transit time flow meter. You don't need to go away to school anymore. And as I said, seek out the meters that now have the new logging ability. You can log data on SD card. In fact, you can actually log screenshots. So when you're up on the ladder, you press one button, it just takes a picture of what's on the screen. Getting closer to iPhone and laptop technologies here. Let's talk at the economics. We said the dedicated transit time flow meters, you can start buying something for around two grand. Professional ultrasonic transit time flow meter handheld meters start at about five grand and go up. And so the basic ones to get something that's going to give you your 1% kind of accuracies that you're going to use to calibrate other meters, calibrate your hydronic system there, uh, support your other technology there. If you get a 10% clamp on ultrasonic transit time flow meter, you're not, you didn't pay a lot of money for it and the answers are kind of fishy. So there are degrees depending upon what you want to use it for. Single piece transducer, as I said, uh, any transit time flow meter that has multiple transducers is is got to be required. Ones that have single sensors usually have limiting factors on the small and the large size, and they're usually just one megahertz. Transducers that usually do small pipes are usually higher frequencies, uh, two to four megahertz, uh, usually two inches and less. 
and then above two inches most of them are one megahertz and then some of the really large pipe size applications it's half megahertz so if you don't have a meter that has the ability to monitor different frequencies again it's not what I would call a professional ultrasonic transit time flow meter so we basically have starting points for a portable device of about six grand and as I say they go up from there you can double that price very easily depending upon who you're working with uh, different manufacturers so the question is if you use it not a whole lot should you purchase it or not rule of thumb that I hear from most of our friends in the field there three months or more capital expense you should consider buying the technology three months or less or you just have a single project you can rent this thing for 600 bucks a week that really opens the door because not everybody had six grand but a lot of people can squeeze out 600 bucks so all of a sudden the usage of ultrasonic transit flow meters are used by professional people they use now by plumbers they use by plant maintenance people they use by facilities people how much water did I use is the question bingo you can now answer that with a clamp on ultrasonic transit type flow meter with a quick flow survey so what do we learn today there are different types of ultrasonic flow meters there's Doppler transit clamp on there's multi-path there's wetted sensors there ultrasonic flow meters are application sensitive not much more than anything else but we had to define where they work where they work in a cleaner liquid whether they work in a dirty or slurry liquid whether we have straight run a pipe ultrasonic flow meter features well they display data they can transmit data they can collect data they can have unique communications to tie into your existing DNS systems if you need that ultrasonic flow meters budget well you have the ability uh, if on a portable basis it's a capital expense uh, versus rental that's going to be time management what are the most practical solutions for you as we said the dedicated ultrasonic transit time flow meters price point are so sweet that there's no reason to use an invasive technology because the accuracies are better and the price points are better and there's no maintenance instruments direct what about us well we've been around for a very long time and uh, we are basically an ultrasonic flow meter engineering company we have the uh, value of working in this industry for over 37 years we do the beta testing for most manufacturers of ultrasonic flow meters we manufacture some value added features and some other technology and of course we rent ultrasonic flow meters and of course we sell a whole bunch of different brands of ultrasonic flow meter provide service and training flow surveys product development and so on uh, for additional information uh, about ultrasonic flow meters or other flow meters we have recorded many other training videos and webinars under the learn tab across the top so feel free to watch any other uh, videos uh, at no charge in addition to that you'll find most of the ultrasonic flow meters on our website you'll find operation manuals uh, software for some and uh, supplies if you need cables and grease and so on so we appreciate your attending our program today should you have any additional questions uh, feel free to drop us an email give us a call stay tuned for our future webinar sessions